Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's a pleasure to rise again to continue my remarks on the sub-amendment to the amendment to Motion 7. And I stress that again because uh, if, if the opportunity permits, I hope to speak again on the amendment and perhaps on the motion itself. Um, Mr. Speaker, as we discussed a little bit yesterday, one of the premises we have in, in Canadian society is, and it can be applied to, to parliaments, it can be applied to, uh, to sports and a lot of other domains, is that generally we all have to live by rules and that those rules are generally agreed upon by all the players, all the parties involved, and that those rules are enforced equally. Here in the legislature we have, we have a set of rules. It's a written and our unwritten constitution, and as you can see by the stack of books on the clerk's desk and, and the library that we have here, there's importance that's paid attention to tradition and precedent in these rules. So we have a written and an unwritten constitution. Now, Mr. Speaker, I see this amendment as an attack on the people as represented by the legislative branch by the executive branch, the Premier's office. Because it is the people that we represent here in this House. In this legislative branch, we are the direct representatives of the people. Other, other branches are, are representatives of the people, perhaps, but they're more indirect. They're not directly elected by the people. And the executive branch ultimately is appointed by the Premier. So the legislative part the legislative branch is the only part of our system that is directly responsible and accountable to the people. And that's why the rules and the privileges that we enjoy as MLAs are so important. Because we are the people that are ultimately responsible to the people. We are the, the MLAs that are elected as their representatives. And we are ultimately the people that are accountable. And as we discussed yesterday, we're part of the legislative branch and that branch has two key roles. The first of which is to see where the money goes. That's why we have estimates, that's why we have the budgeting process, and it's an important part of how government is done to see where the, where, where the people's money is spent. And that is done in this House by the function of the Committee of Supply. And then the second key part of the legislative branch is making law. And we've seen examples of that here today. And that is that one of the key parts of that is the function of Committee of the Whole to administer that. So these two key committees, these committees of the whole House, of which all MLAs are members and all MLAs can vote and all MLAs can propose amendments and participate fully in the debate, these two committees of the whole House are crucial and central to our system. And importantly, here in New Brunswick, we have a long tradition that's part of our unwritten constitution that means that they are an essential stage in the way a bill becomes a law. Now, Mr. Speaker, my concern about this amendment is that it seeks to remove these committees as a crucial stage. And as I say, this cuts to the very core of what we do here. They seek to remove these committees from the process and effectively transfer that power to subcommittees. Now that sounds, in principle, like not a bad idea, but the reality is that in subcommittees, not all members have a say. Not all members are members of these subcommittees. Not all MLAs can vote or, or uh, propose amendments. They may attend any committee, any member can attend any committee, but they're not a fully-fledged member and their vote doesn't count. Whereas in Committees of the Whole, or Committee of Supply, which is a committee of the whole house, these committees, every MLA has their input. And my concern is that moving these, this essential stage of a bill into smaller committees ensures that once again the government always has a stronger majority. And that the, 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 the ability of the people to be represented by their MLAs is diminished. And that is a significant, significant change to what we have now. So we're not talking about changing the lunch hour, we're not talking about something that's administrative, we're talking about something to me that cuts to the core of what we do here in this legislature and the core of how we as, as, as deputies, as MLAs are representing our people. Now Mr. Speaker, I, before I was privileged to, uh, to be elected to this legislature, I spent some time as an army officer and I would often see new commanders come in. And uh, it always concerned me when commanders came in they were empowered to be in command. And often, they would treat that unit like their own train set. And they would change a lot of things and remake it in their image. And then a few years later, another commander would come along and do the same thing. And we've all, through our own personal and professional lives, lived in times of change and seen constant change. And that's not good for any institution. It's actually very expensive in terms of personal energy and often in terms of real cost. And I. One man that I really respected was uh, the current commander of the Royal Canadian Navy, and that's Admiral Mark Norman. And when he took control of the Royal Canadian Navy, 
he looked upon it very much not as his train set, but he saw himself as a caretaker, as a guardian of that institution, to shepherd it through good times and bad times into the future. And he knew that his tenure would be short in the grand scheme of history, but that it was his job to be a shepherd, to be a caretaker. And Mr. Speaker, what I'm seeing across the aisle from the current Premier is not that. I'm seeing a regime that considers this legislature to be part of their train set. And then they can arbitrarily go forth and determine how this legislature will run and, and pay no heed to all of the traditions that have established this legislature as a functioning institution that respects the values and the traditions of, of the people of New Brunswick. <coughs> the Premier, through, through a number of factors that we discussed yesterday in, my, in, in the first part of my speech, has a tremendous amount of power in this equation. But Mr. Speaker, he doesn't need all of the power. The centralization of power in, in central agencies through the growth of the civil service, through the media, through technology, that's all meant that power is centralized in, in central offices, particularly in, in the leader or a prime minister or the premier's office. And as Lord Acton said, Mr. Speaker, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And what I fear that I'm seeing across the aisle is a constant move toward more and more power being assembled in the premier's office. And the result of that is now trickling down to this institution, which is separate from the Premier's office, which is separate from the executive branch of government, and that has its own rights and traditions that we should protect. Mr. Speaker, to use a metaphor, the people of New Brunswick loan the Premier the keys, but they don't buy the car for him. It's not his car. He gets to drive it around for a while, but at the end of the day, it's the people's car. Mr. Speaker, it's not his car. Now to go back to another point that I raised yesterday, and really what is at the crux of my argument, is that process and procedure does matter. And a famous Canadian scholar, Marshall McLuhan, a media scholar, once famously commented that the medium is the message. And I would suggest to you, Mr. Speaker, that here in this House, the process is in fact the product. Because as we've seen, legislation comes into this House and leaves largely unchanged. And the only thing that we could do in this House effectively is go through a process that hopes to raise concerns about that legislation to the public level. And that is why the process is important, and that is why there is value in the process. Now, Mr. Speaker, to quote another philosopher, Francis Fukuyama, he posited a while ago that we were at the end of history. And what that was to say was that the institutions that we had developed through civil society had reached their, their best stage. Not to say there was never going to be any evolution, but that we had passed through a period of history that was very turbulent, and that democratic institutions and civil society, the court system, the legislative system that we had, had brought us to a point of relative peace and stability, and that that would continue in the future as long as those institutions were preserved. And so therefore, Mr. Speaker, there is value in those institutions. They have got us this far, peacefully, to end us in a peaceful position, and we need to protect them. And as I mentioned yesterday, my concern about this legislation is that it is not the product, it is not the product, this motion I should say, is not the product of an informed, public, open, transparent, inclusive, holistic investigation that should have happened. An investigation that starts from the position of what do we want to achieve and then works backward from there to examine how we achieve it. That is a logical scientific method that could be applied here. But Mr. Speaker, that's not what we've seen applied. What we saw was a, a fait accompli, a list of 31 changes from the pen of the Premier's office, presented to committee and passed through that committee, and now on the floor of this legislature, that is going to be passed by the majority that this government possesses. It was a set of rule changes that was examined only through the lens of the Premier's office, only through what was best for them. Like I say, we didn't start with what's best for all of us and work back from there. No, it was deliberately constructed to benefit the Premier's office. And the much lauded uh, consultation that happened with the me member for Fredericton South, I, I appreciate his input, but the reality is that none of us in here are experts in legislative or constitutional affairs. And all of that consultation resulted in only one amendment to 33, or sorry, 31 changes. Only one substantive amendment. And that's a concern as well. There was not a public debate. There was not a full examination of these issues. And the result is clear. 
we have a set of changes with one minor little tweaking that executes what the Premier's office wants to achieve. And this, Mr. Speaker, it's worth noting, is the most significant change in our rules in a generation. And I'm glad to see that, that this amendment has come forward because it does seize on one, only one, but one of the crucial constitutional aspects of these changes. And as I've discussed, this is a change in, in the essential nature of how a bill becomes a law, how, how our bills process through, through the legislature, that actually takes power away from the legislature. And the irony is that this amendment is based on the fact that power has been taken away, and this amendment seeks to give back a sliver of that, a scrap of the leftover power. Now let's examine the logical chain that brought about this amendment. <coughs> The first, I assume, the intention was to move bills from consideration in Committee of the Whole or, committee, or, or estimates in the Committee of Supply, move those to subcommittees. And like I say, that's not a bad idea if it's an additional stage. But if it's the only stage, it's very dangerous. And my concern is, as we've discovered, not all members sit on those committees. And so that necessitated this amendment, this amendment that seeks to allow members not to vote, but allows them to move amendments. And like I say, this is a power that members already have. It's members already have the right to vote. I see I have one minute left. Is that right, Mr. Yes. Speaker? Okay, I was looking at the clerk's desk. I thought I had a few more. So my concern, Mr. Speaker, is clear. This amendment is derived from a faulty premise. It is derived from the fact that this government wants to take power away from this legislature and then give us back a scrap of it. Mr. Speaker, I do not support the move of these, these committees as the move of these of bills to these committees. What I support is the traditional method we have in this legislature that has served us well, that these bills are referred directly to the committee of the whole house, be it supply or, or committee of the whole. Mr. Speaker, I know that backbenchers in the government are scratching their heads because they're new to all of this. And uh, the reality is that this is going to have a direct impact on them. It is difficult to sit back there, I know. And they have to understand that this privilege that you may be giving up is crucial to your role in this legislature. And Mr. Speaker, how are we doing for time? Okay. No, sorry, I thought I, I thought I had a few more moments. No, it's just uh, time has elapsed.